Oh, yeah. When you first came out with this book, I mean, you got my attention right away because I remember, and this has been less so since I've been a consultant, although I've been a deeply embedded consultant at several organizations, including uh, Maxwell, which has some generational diversity, obviously. But I can remember working for one organization for about 10 years. And for the bulk of that 10 years, I was the only person in my generation. I'm a I'm Generation X. At the time, I was, I think, uh, 20, 27 to 37, 28 to 38, something like that. And everyone else that worked there, as you might can guess, was a baby boomer. And by the way, I think you're technically a baby boomer. You're like on the very, you're like barely a boomer. Now these yep, people were at the boomer. top end. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, because you're you're within that margin of error. Well, all the people that I worked with were at the top end of the boomer generation, and some of them I could have been builders uh, mentally, but um, but yeah, I'm right, kind of smack dab in the middle. Um, I think of Gen X, seven, 1976. So I'm kind of I think Gen X started a few years before before I was born. Yeah. But um, but I can tell you that the generational differences were very stark. Now, here's what's funny, though. All the things you were describing about Gen Z nowadays in the workplace was a little bit me, not so much. But then I ended up going to work for a place where I was the average five years older than everybody. I think we're all technically the same generation. But because I'd yeah. been around true boomers for so many yeah. years, they kind of saw me as a boomer because I picked up a lot of the preferences and styles yeah. and whatever was expected of boomers. So I think, and we'll talk about this in a minute. There's there's an uh, there's a great assessment for called the generational quotient in which I actually ended up scoring as I identify more with boomers than than Xers. So anyway, um, but one thing I want to mention too because I, I we talked a little bit earlier regarding the eight paradox about tensions and one of the chapters in a new kind of diversity is all about managing preferences, tensions, and expectations. So what makes each of these so challenging, yet so beneficial for leaders to manage? Thank you, Will, for asking that. I hope I do justice with this answer. I love that chapter. In fact, that chapter may be the one that's most helpful if people said, I'm gonna use this like an encyclopedia and just read one part or two parts, because beginning in the job interview, the HR exec or the hiring manager needs to begin to figure out the the expectations, the um, preferences. In fact, can I add sometimes the demands of a Gen Z free agent that comes in expecting or demanding this. And you need to figure that out and go, you know what? We are not your place, buddy. I got to lead you to the door and pray for you that you're going to find another job somewhere else. So real quick. Um, I think everybody in a job interview brings in some expectations, the assumptions of how work is going to be. I think it's good to talk about those. And often as a hiring manager, say, here's how we look. Does that suit you okay? Because if it doesn't, tell me now. Um, I believe conflict uh, expands based on the distance between expectations and reality. So I, well, here's the illustration I always give. If I tell my wife I'm going to be home at 7 for dinner and I get home at 7.10, not a big deal. If I get home at 9.30, that's a big deal. And it's not because my wife can't live without me for two and a half hours. It's because I established an expectation that was not the reality. So I think leaders need to figure this out. You don't have to be perfect leaders, but be honest about here. here here's our imperfections. Can you live with this? So we all have preferences. We, I prefer it to be this way, but if it's not, I'm okay. We'll have expectations. That's a little stronger. And then we'll, quite frankly, I think we sometimes bring in demands, particularly post-2020, where we began to polarize even more as a nation. Black Lives Matter, which is a great cause, but boy, did we not polarize over how we were going to respond to that issue. So I'm afraid that now we're digging our heels in on issues that probably are preferences, but we act like they're demands. These are emotional, intelligent issues. So I'm going to make a statement for hopefully that's helpful to your listeners. Social skills appreciate over time. Technical skills depreciate with time, but we don't act like it. Isn't it true? You learn a technical skill in college five years later, it's, 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 it's no longer applicable. We, we got to relearn. I think you build social skills, interpersonal skills. They never go away. And I think the higher you go in your organization, the higher your EQ needs to be. That's my belief. 